Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Blanding, and I'm with the US Department of Energy Building Energy Codes Program. And so welcome to the next installment of the National Energy Codes Conference Summer Seminar Series. So I will be the moderator for today's session, which is focused on offsite construction and its intersection with building codes and standards. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today and a great panel of experts to make us smart on this topic. Um, but before I do, I'll talk a little bit about what we have upcoming in the seminar series. So next slide, please, Richard. So um, this is the second to last uh, installment of the series uh, focused on offsite construction. Um, the next installment will be in November, November 17th, focused on multifamily buildings. So we hope you'll join us uh, for that conversation. If you missed any of the previous discussions on stretch codes or utility uh, programs or anything else, um, you can certainly um, go to our website, um, energycodes.gov backslash 2022 summer seminar series and look at the recordings and, and uh, find the presentations um, that have been presented there. Um, so before we get started and uh, introduce the speakers, I want to uh, set the stage a little bit for today's discussion. Um, so offsite construction, which uh, you know is comprised of uh, many different um, types of construction, whether it's panelized construction or modular construction, um, has been touted to provide uh, many benefits, including reduced construction times, uh, consistently higher performing buildings, reduced cost, lower environmental impacts and less waste, um, but building codes, standards, and other land use regulations such as zoning is often highlighted as a barrier to the offsite industry. Um, some of these specific building code challenges that have been documented exist due to uh, code fragmentation across the nation, um, inconsistencies in state and local inspection processes, uh, and a lack of understanding of how the offsite construction practice and current inspection processes work. Um, so luckily, we have a, a great group of panelists to make us smarter about this topic, and we'll likely touch on many of these challenges, um, hopefully highlight uh, the understanding of um, the current offsite construction industry, and then also discuss opportunities and new initiatives to move um, the space forward. So I'm joined by three offsite experts. Um, so Lucas Toffoli is a principal of RMI's carbon-free building uh, practice and also leads the Department of Energy's Advanced Building Construction Initiative. Uh, Ryan Kolker is the VP of Innovation at ICC uh, and also leads the development of the new offsite construction standards, among many other things. And then Dr. Kevin Groskopf is a professor at the Charles W. Durham School of Architectural Engineering and Construction at the University of Nebraska and also the principal investigator on a DOE funded code compliance study on offsite buildings, which he will talk about today. Um, so, with that quick introduction, I will turn things over to our first speaker, um, Lucas. So, Lucas, if you're out there, can you please um, go ahead and take it away? Thanks, Ian, for the introduction. Um, as Ian said, I'm Lucas Toffoli. I'm at uh, RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. And uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about our work on the Advanced Building Construction Collaborative and specifically our work relating to codes there. Um, and within that, we're lucky to have uh, Ryan and ICC as one of our collaborators. So then Ryan will get into uh, more detail about uh, some of the things that we're collaborating on and some of the great work that ICC is doing to uh, move this space forward. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of take, taking a step back, um, our motivation at RMI, at the Carbon Free Buildings Program at RMI, and also within the advanced building construction work uh, at, at DOE uh, with the ABC initiative and these, this ABC collaborative is this kind of confluence of critical challenges that the building sector is facing. Um, you know, perhaps the most existential of all of them is climate change with um, you know, huge disasters increasing in frequency, and that has uh, kind of an important uh, element of codes to it because with codes making buildings more energy efficient, we can reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but we can also make buildings uh, more resilient uh, to climate disasters. 
uh, that uh, unfortunately we're having to grapple with uh, more and more. Uh, there's also a, a deficit of millions of units of attainable housing that is placing a burden on families as well as the economy across the country. And uh, that's exacerbated by a kind of flat uh, labor productivity over the last several decades in the construction uh, industry as compared to uh, other sectors of the economy. Next slide, please. So our kind of goal here with the ABC Collaborative um, and, and really with the Carbon Free Buildings Program is to decarbonize the U.S. building stock before 2050 while also improving other endpoints like resilience, affordability, and equity uh, in kind of an integrative way. Uh, next slide, please. And our hypothesis with advanced building construction specifically is that by modernizing the construction industry, uh, including with things like industrialized and offsite construction, and by using more holistic definitions of what quality and value are in buildings, including things like better performance and better resilience, we can accelerate the pace at which decarbonization strategies are adopted by the mainstream building sector, which so far has been quite slow. Uh, next slide, please. And our approach, what we call ABC or advanced building construction, uh, is really kind of the intersection of two things. And we work on both retrofit and new construction. Uh, and it's solutions that combine uh, energy efficient building decarbonization, which is critical both for uh, the um, emissions and uh, uh, kind of climate uh, elements, but also for having greater resilience in our building stock. Uh, and then this idea of scalable, streamlined, industrialized construction approaches. Uh, and it's really the, the mating of these two things because without modernizing construction, without industrializing construction, we can't really do this fast enough. And without this uh, focus on energy efficient decarbonization, uh, if we get better at industrialized construction without that, then we're just going to get better and faster at building uh, buildings that are not um, uh, high performing enough. Next slide, please. So, you know, deep energy efficiency, the reason why that is, is part of this equation, again, is uh, uh, for questions of, of climate, but also for these other substantial co-benefits like uh, potentially reduced maintenance, uh, increased thermal and acoustic comfort from having um, better, tighter envelopes, improved indoor air quality and health outcomes through tighter envelopes, better ventilation, better HVAC systems, as well as eliminating uh, both on-site and kind of systemic uh, combustion of fossil fuels, which there's a growing body of evidence are uh, pretty bad for respiratory health, especially for vulnerable and, and younger populations. Uh, resilience, as I mentioned, including passive survivability in the event of extreme weather events, and then, of course, reduced emissions for climate as well as compliance, and the compliance piece is, is increasingly important in places like Washington, D.C., Washington State, California, New York City, Boston, and other jurisdictions. And electrical grid stability, I think that's an important one where it, it, if we just electrify uh, the entire building stock, that would get at some of the endpoints that we're looking for. Uh, but not all of them. And one of the endpoints that might be hindered uh, by just wholesale electrification without um, energy efficiency uh, would be the stability of the electrical grid, especially as electrification buildings happens in parallel with transportation electrification. Uh, next slide, please. And then the, the second half of this, again, is industrialized construction. So you know, what it really comes down to is being able to rapidly deploy energy efficient, low carbon buildings at scale or zero carbon buildings at scale. And given that we have uh, something like 100 million dwelling units in the U.S. plus um, uh, several million uh, commercial buildings, uh, that is a large amount of building stock uh, that needs to be decarbonized in a pretty short amount of time. And it's not going to happen with the conventional approaches to construction uh, that, that we've been using. Uh, only a small percentage of US construction uses industrialized approaches, which include things like prefabrication, modular construction, but also more broadly things like digitized workflows and digital tools, uh, kind of integrated workflows and feedback loops, uh, reality capture, robotics and automation, uh, 3D printing, and a lot of these other uh, technologies and approaches that are uh, fairly mainstream in, in other highly industrialized industries, but not yet in construction. 
um, we see a huge potential for this one and a half trillion dollar uh, industry to industrialize. Um, it's one of the largest um, industrial uh, or uh, economic sectors in the U.S., um, but again, lagging behind in terms of uh, this kind of modernization and development. And really, we see a need for industry and the public sector to collaborate to achieve this, um, but also for uh, codes to become an enabler and not a barrier, as, as Ian was saying earlier. Uh, fragmentation with codes, outdated codes, inconsistent application and enforcement of codes. These are all barriers to industrialized construction becoming more mainstream uh, because they erode the ability to deploy uh, the kind of technical as well as process solutions in a way that is consistent and allows for um, economies of scale and efficient deployment. Next slide, please. So our mission with the ABC Collaborative is to uh, work with incumbent as well as emergent building sector actors to accelerate the mainstream ado adoption of ABC in service, again, of building decarbonization as well as those other endpoints while modernizing and leveraging the modernization of the U.S. construction industry. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we love to engage with diverse audiences like folks who are in attendance here um, to really get at those incumbent as well as emergent building sector actors. Um, and I think the idea of codes is, is really germane to uh, all of the above. Our vision for the next decade or so is to increase uh, the rate of zero carbon retrofits to more than 3 million per year. That's the trajectory we need to be on in order to decarbonize the whole stock by around 2050 or before 2050. Right now, that rate is uh, you know very, very small. Uh, especially when you're looking only at net zero uh, carbon retrofits um, and probably needs to increase something like uh, 15x or, or even more depending on how specific you want to get. And all new construction also needs to be net zero carbon uh, by about 2030. Uh, in terms of technology, we don't think that's going to happen without uh, greater penetration of ABC um, technologies and approaches, particularly um, that industrialized construction. Uh, and there's also this element of delivery where we need um, business solutions, policy solutions, regulatory solutions, including uh, um, updates and evolution to code uh, in order to enable uh, uh, this to happen. Next slide, please. So where, where we work uh, with the collaborative is in these kind of five um, you know, main areas that build up towards you know, this, this market scaling support, which is kind of a um, you know, integrative set of support services that we're developing to facilitate the, the transacting of uh, actual ABC projects and pipelines of projects. But what's really fundamental to this is these foundational activities, and I'll talk a little bit more about those, uh, which is the convening that we do through our working groups and our thought leadership and education that we do through research and analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, one of our working groups is specifically our, our codes working group, which again, um, Ryan and uh, ICC are, are kind of industry subject matter expert leads uh, for that. Um, we also have uh, other topical working groups that are shown here, but in the codes working group, we've really focused on uh, how, do we, um, how do we use codes and, and uh, you know, permitting and inspection and accreditation as an enabler of industrialized and offsite construction in service of that decarbonization and those other positive endpoints. Uh, next slide, please. And um, in terms of thought leadership, we're doing a lot of research and analysis. Uh, a big piece that will be coming out uh, later this fall is this industry guidance report, which has more to do with um, uh, guidance on performance levels for new construction as well as retrofits and, and prioritizing different segments of the residential building stock. Uh, but one specific to code, a piece of thought leadership that we released recently earlier this summer was this uh, brief that came out of our codes working group that was uh, specifically about off-site construction codes, uh, which again, uh, Ryan will talk more about. And so that is an area where um, you know, we see ourselves adding, adding value to the conversation uh, by taking the things that we discuss and work on in these working groups and turning them into uh, some of these outputs, um, including in the area of codes like this working group brief. 
Um, next slide, please. So just to close, we have um, a wide range of uh, organizations that are engaged with and collaborating with uh, the ABC Collaborative. Uh, some of them are here, although this slide now is out of date because we keep having uh, more folks uh, kind of flock to the cause, which is very exciting. Um, if you know uh, people on the line are, are interested in becoming more involved in the collaborative, please feel free to reach out to, to me or to the collaborative via our website. Uh, but what I really want to do now is leave time and space for uh, Ryan and others to talk more specifically about the work they're doing. And, and Ryan in particular, I know, is going to talk about some of those offsite construction codes that have been uh, such a topic of focus for some of our collaborative activities. So thanks very much for the time. Uh, thanks, Ian. I'll, I'll hand it back uh, to you and Ryan. Okay. Well, thanks, Lucas. Okay. I guess I can uh, just go. Jump yeah, sorry, Ryan. I was just trying to find the unmute button. Go, go for it. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be with you today and share a little bit about um, some of the activities that the Code Council has underway to really help uh, advance the deployment of offsite construction and address a lot of the barriers that both Ian and, and Lucas identified. Uh, and I also want to give uh, you know a great shout out to, to DOE and the ABC Collaborative and, and RMI and all the, the partners that are really helping to, to push these issues. Um, I, I, I guess you know folks probably have uh, some familiarity with uh, the Code Council and our work in developing you know model building codes, standards, and some of the tools that really help uh, support their deployment. Um, but I think you know folks may not really um, have a good handle on some of the work that we're doing uh, to support offsite construction. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so Ian, uh, you know, really sort of talked about some of the challenges that um, society and the building industry are facing. Uh, and so we've you know really recognized uh, those as well. You know whether that's uh, building quality, uh, you know workforce related issues, uh, sustainability needs, uh, affordability. Uh, you know, the ability to, to have buildings up and running uh, quicker, which certainly impact uh, the, the affordability as well, uh, and then job site safety. And so really looking at, uh, you know, sort of the goal and mission of ICC to, you know, support safe, sustainable, and resilient buildings and communities, you know, offsite construction really provides um, an avenue uh, to really achieve those goals. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, the challenge is, you know, if we think about um, sort of the code landscape, the inspection process um, that, you know, we have in place today, it's primarily based off of a, you know, site built, um, you know, sort of strategy. Um, and if you look at, you know, sort of the, the structure uh, or the home on, on the left, you know, you can really sort of understand the ability to have a you know, site-based inspection process where, you know, an inspector can show up, you know, periodically, um, sort of see the progress, understand, you know, sort of what's going on um, in that building, uh, and really, you know, check against the, the code requirements uh, in that community. But as we move to sort of more and more, uh, you know, off-site construction, you know, we get sort of the situation on the right where what's showing up on the job site is you know, at an increased level of uh, finish, um, you know, it's not easy to for the local code official to sort of understand, um, you know, what went into, you know, creating that module, uh, what's behind the walls, you know, is everything, um, you know, done correctly. And so really thinking about sort of what is the approach to assure that, um, you know, that module is achieving the same level of, you know, safety and efficiency um, that we would get, you know, from, from a site built um, structure. And so, you know, really having Sort of that conversation working through you know that strategy is really important to be able to drive uh, progress within the offsite construction space uh, so you can go to the next slide and so you know i think it's important up front to really sort of understand um, you know what makes um, you know, sort of different approaches to offsite construction different um, so you know taking sort of offsite construction as sort of the difference between open and closed construction so uh, you know, open construction is, you know, something shows up to the job site, um, the local inspector can still sort of see everything that's going on, you know, within that individual component. So we may see, you know, increased levels of um, sort of finish or um, bringing together, you know, different components 
um, but still allowing sort of that local code official to really understand uh, what's going on. And so that's really open construction. Um, as we continue to get, you know, more and more uh, components, you know, in the factory, um, we get to this situation of closed construction where um, once something leaves the factory, it's really hard for uh, the local code inspector to really understand, you know, what is behind the walls. Uh, and so, you know, we have the picture of the pod here with, you know, integrated plumbing, electrical, um, sort of all of those pieces. And so when that does show up on the job site, um, you know, the local code inspector can't really understand what's behind the walls, you know, without actually, uh, you know, disassembling um, that pod. Uh, which then, you know, certainly defeats the, the sort of efficiencies and opportunities that offsite construction provides. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So from our perspective, um, you know, offsite construction, uh, here's the definition um, that we've used in uh, the standards, which I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. Uh, but it's a, you know, modular building or component or panelized system uh, designed and constructed uh, to meet the requirements of the standard uh, built in a factory. Um, that's on a separate building site. So we're not talking about, um, you know, a contractor, uh, you know, setting up a tent or warehouse, you know, next to the building site, but actually an established, uh, you know, factory uh, or manufacturing plant uh, to undertake this process. And then it's manufactured in such a manner that all parts or processes cannot be inspected at the installation site uh, without disassembly damage to our destruction. Arm. So really covering um, that closed construction um, element of offsite construction. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, so, you know, with that sort of broad definition uh, and a lot of the activities that are going on within the offsite construction space, uh, we're seeing a you know, whole bunch of different uh, strategies. So you know, everything from um, tiny houses to, uh, you know, modular uh, residences, modular commercial buildings, uh, panelized systems, a use of shipping containers, uh, bathroom and kitchen pods. Uh, and so, you know, certainly looking at all of these um, different approaches, um, again, thinking about sort of what is the regulatory approach um, necessary to, uh, you know, assure that, you know, all of these pieces are delivering, you know, the, the efficiency, uh, sustainability, uh, and resilience and safety that we really expect, uh, you know, from these buildings. Um, and I think the, really the sort of important key um, to all of this is, you know, all of these offsite construction projects uh, need to meet the same building code requirements as uh, as any other building in the jurisdiction where they're going to end up. Um, but the wrinkle there is, you know, these these uh, different components may actually be um, assembled or fabricated in factories that are hundreds uh, or even thousands of miles away, you know, from their uh, final resting place. And so that's another sort of wrinkle um, in the process. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So we did want to capture um, sort of an idealized approach to support the regulatory process, sort of recognizing a lot of those challenges, um, you know, that that I mentioned. So um, we have 35 states that have uh, statewide programs for offsite construction. Uh, so the state program is responsible for uh, the offsite construction elements of a project, and the local jurisdiction is then responsible for uh, the assembly. Uh, of that project, the site work, the foundation work. And really, you know, from a statewide level, uh, really relying on um, in-factory inspection, plan review, um, and, and really focusing on, you know, those off-site construction uh, elements of a project. Uh, and then, you know, where it's practical, uh, relying on uh, third-party services who have expertise in this space, um, you know, can be in those factories that may be, again, you know, hundreds of miles away, um, from the jurisdiction and really being the eyes and the ears of um, the authorities having jurisdiction to assure that uh, you know, what is going on in the factory ultimately ends up uh, you know, in compliant buildings uh, you know, where, where they land. Uh, and so this is sort of the, uh, the process um, that many states follow um, and that you know, again supports sort of consistency um, in that process. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And so, you know, I mentioned the, the importance of um, plan review. So really understanding um, from a, a design perspective, um, you know, all of the elements that go into uh, you know, offsite construction uh, pieces of a building, having that upfront plan review, uh, not dissimilar to what, you know, many jurisdictions do uh, on the site built side, 
um, but really, you know, paying attention to the, the specific, you know, offsite construction elements. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And then, you know, certainly um, with all of the activity happening in the factory, um, the in-plant inspection process is really, you know, what's important. That's where you verify that, um, you know, the plumbing systems are, uh, you know, connected properly. The proper materials are being used. Um, the, you know, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, sort of hiccups, you know, along the, the development, pro the construction process uh, are picked up, you know, in the factory. And so whatever comes off, uh, you know, the, the factory floor and is transported, you know, to the job site, uh, you know, meets the requirements of that local jurisdiction. I think one other uh, important aspect um, to this process is the factory itself. Uh, and so you can go to the next slide. Um, and so, uh, you know, in addition to the inspection process on the factory floor, uh, you know, each of uh, the manufacturing facilities themselves also need to produce a quality insurance uh, and quality uh, control program, uh, which is certified or verified um, either by a third party agency uh, or the state to make sure that um, you know, there, there's uh, safeguards in place at the factory level, there's safeguards in place at the um, individual uh, you know, construction uh, or fabrication stations uh, within the manufacturing facility itself. Uh, and so this diagram really sort of captures you know, various different stages uh, that we would see in the manufacturing process uh, and the importance of inspection at each of these, uh, you know, different points uh, in the process. And so, again, assuring that we have sort of this complete picture of, um, you know, what's coming out of the factory actually meets uh, the local code requirements. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And so then, you know, sort of once something comes off the line, really assuring that local code officials have the ability to understand, you know, sort of what's landing in their jurisdiction. You know, has there been a uh, inspection process, you know, associated with those different components? And then, what are the individual roles and responsibilities of uh, the local code official? And so, on the left, we've captured uh, some of the labels that um, these state programs, uh, uh, you know, give to um, manufacturers that that um, you know units are inspected. Uh, and they have the, the quality assurance program in place. Uh, and so local code officials really need to look to these labels as the verification process that, um, you know, the modules or, or panels, you know, have gone through that process. Um, they meet the, the code requirements, uh, you know, in that jurisdiction, in that state. Um, and then being able to, um, you know, monitor the, the assembly uh, and site work, uh, you know, for those particular projects. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so I did mention the, the sort of uh, 35 uh, statewide programs uh, that uh, tackle offsite construction. But I think with anything, um, you know, sort of in the, the code landscape and, and in the U.S. in general, um, you know, each of these 35 programs are a little bit different. So um, some require, uh, uh, you know, all of the, the plan review and inspection process and quality assurance verification process to be conducted. Um, by state employees. Um, so, you know, that in and of itself uh, could create some challenges around, uh, you know, capacity, um, around ability to inspect in, uh, again, factories that, you know, could be um, hundreds uh, or even thousands of miles away. Um, some states do allow um, third party uh, inspection agencies uh, like ICCNTA uh, to perform some or all of those functions. So some states allow third party plan review, um, some states allow third party inspections, some states allow both. And so, you know, that certainly creates um, some inefficiencies uh, in the offsite construction process as well, uh, particularly for, you know, manufacturers that may be um, servicing, you know, multiple different states. Um, so what happens in uh, the states that actually don't have statewide programs, um, that entire offsite construction process falls to local officials. Um, and so, you know, thinking about sort of the challenges that um, local officials could have, you know, relative to offsite construction, uh, you know, without the, the sort of expertise or familiarity you know, with these types of projects, um, you know, having, having to go through, uh, you know, sort of a verification process at, at each individual uh, project um, really, again, you know, creates uh, significant inefficiencies uh, in that process. Um, 
And so I'll talk about uh, in a minute the uh, sort of challenge that uh, Salt Lake City had um, in addressing or utilizing uh, offsite construction strategies. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so with all of those challenges uh, and needs, uh, the Code Council, working with the Modular Building Institute, uh, developed two standards, uh, American national standards, uh, through a consensus process to really address um, you know, the, the um, design side of the equation and the inspection uh, and regulatory compliance side of the equation um, to really help drive consistency uh, and really capture the efficiency that offsite construction provides. We're also in the process right now of uh, developing uh, ICC MBI standard 1210, uh, which covers the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, energy efficiency, and water conservation opportunities uh, in offsite construction. So um, thinking about sort of the interconnections of building systems from module to module, um, but also maybe some of the opportunities that a factory built setting really provides to capture uh, increased energy efficiency opportunities and water conservation opportunities. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned the, the two standards really work in tandem to help support uh, the uh, advancement of offsite construction. Uh, so 1200 covers the planning, design, fabrication, and assembly process, really targeting you know, designers, manufacturers, um, and folks you know, throughout that process um, to really help uh, demonstrate compliance with uh, you know, codes and standards in a, in a way that really fits with the offsite construction process itself. Uh, and then standard 1205 uh, really covers, uh, you know, what are the roles of code officials, state programs, uh, third party inspection uh, and plan review agencies uh, to really help, again, streamline that process, uh, provide best practices and really leverage, um, you know, the opportunities that offsite construction provides. Um, so you can go to the next slide. One thing I will note is, um, you know, manufactured housing uh, really sits outside of um, the, the code landscape that, you know, most folks are familiar with. Um, you know, HUD uh, actually has uh, its manufactured home construction uh, and safety standards, which cover sort of the, uh, the structure itself. Um, there are still requirements uh, on the local code officials uh, to really uh, focus on the foundation, installation, utilities, uh, any accessories. But I think we're seeing, you know, certainly increased focus on the efficiency of uh, manufactured housing as well. Um, and DOE actually set just set uh, minimum efficiency requirements uh, for manufactured housing uh, based off of the 2021 IECC. So I'm um, starting to see, you know, an increased uh, sort of harmonization around the requirements of uh, manufactured housing uh, and site built and other offsite uh, construction strategies. You can go to the next slide. Um, and you know, one of the, the sort of key uh, issues or challenges is certainly education of uh, code officials, uh, but also of you know, the broader offsite construction industry of um, you know, sort of how the various different regulatory pathways for offsite construction works. Uh, and so we've really been um, ramping up uh, opportunities to you know, provide educational resources uh, to code officials, but also others uh, within the industry. Uh, and so we have a uh, you know, web, web page um, dedicated specifically to uh, offsite construction, uh, talking about the various different uh, types of offsite, um, what are the benefits, uh, what are the, some of the regulatory uh, challenges and, and opportunities. Uh, and then we just released this primer on offsite construction code standards and compliance really diving into, uh, again, the different types of offsite construction, uh, the different strategies that, that can be deployed, um, you know, whether they need to go under a uh, you know, statewide, statewide program, whether there are opportunities to leverage uh, uh, product certification uh, or evaluation services. Uh, so would certainly encourage folks uh, to take a look at that resource. Um, again, really trying to build up um, the education and knowledge um, in this space. You can go to the next slide. And I, I think one really important thing um, that, that folks can really take advantage of is uh, the offsite construction solutions map, uh, which is on that, that web page, um, where, you know, depending on your role uh, within the industry, you know, whether you're an inspection agency, uh, a manufacturer, uh, you know, sort of uh, how, how things are, uh, you know, sort of put together from your perspective, 
what are the resources and tools uh, that can really help support uh, your activity um, and move things forward uh, in the offsite construction space. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so certainly, um, you know, relative to the adoption of uh, ICC MBI uh, 1200 and 1205, um, those are currently available uh, for jurisdictions to adopt. Uh, we have had um, uh, interest in uh, multiple different states, and so um, certainly excited uh, to see that progress moving forward. I did mention Salt Lake City as uh, the initial adopter, actually back in March of 2021, um, before the standards were even complete. Um, and that was, you know, sort of a, a indicative uh, situation that, um, you know, many states and communities, uh, you know, actually fall in relative to uh, opportunities for Salt Lake's, for, you know, communities to support offsite construction. Um, so Salt Lake City had a requirement that um, all projects within the city needed to be inspected uh, by a uh, city employee. Uh, at the same time, the um, city had requirements that um, the inspectors uh, could not leave the city um, for inspections. And so if you think about offsite construction projects, um, that really um, hindered the ability of you know, those projects to actually work. Um, and so they recognized the ability of third parties uh, and the need for third parties uh, to be their eyes and ears uh, you know, in the factories uh, that are outside uh, the city. Uh, and so they adopted the standards to really help uh, facilitate that process. Uh, and so since the city has adopted um, the, the two standards, uh, they've, in, they've seen you know, increase in uh, accessory dwelling units um, and uh, the potential for new offsite construction projects uh, to really address a lot of the challenges um, that they have you know, relative to uh, affordable housing uh, and some of the other needs uh, that they have as a city. So um, really a positive uh, you know, story from that effort. You can go to the next slide. Uh, Lucas did mention, you know, the, the work of the ABC Collaborative uh, to really provide information uh, to really support advancements in the offsite construction space. Uh, and there is this brief um, that the Codes Working Group uh, put together uh, really to amplify the importance of uh, the standards in, you know, moving, uh, you know, communities towards, uh, you know, greater acceptance and use of offsite construction. And really the benefits that uh, standardization you know, provides uh, to the industry. Uh, if we're really looking at enhancing the efficiency of the offsite construction process, um, consistency you know, for uh, manufacturers, uh, how they're going to engage with uh, state and local communities on the regulatory side of the equation is really an, is essential. And so um, you know, having tools uh, you know, like this uh, from the collaborative is, is really essential to uh, you know, driving progress uh, and realizing uh, the change that we need, need to realize to really drive um, efficiency, uh, sustainability, uh, resilience, and addressing many of the, the challenges, you know, we see as an industry uh, and as society. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, always happy to talk about um, the, the work of the Code Council, including efforts around um, tiny houses. Uh, so we did put out uh, international tiny house provisions to capture many of the opportunities in uh, the offsite construction space. Uh, and then you can go to the next slide. Always happy to talk to folks on uh, the various different resources. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and, and please do reach out with any questions uh, that you may have uh, about our work. So appreciate the opportunity and look forward to questions. Great. Thanks so much, Ryan. That was, that was excellent. A lot of really good information. Um, so now we're going to switch gears and hear from uh, Kevin Graskoff with the University of Nebraska about kind of how offsite construction is being implemented in the field uh, with respect to energy code compliance. So with that, Kevin, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take that yep, as a yes. Loud and clear. All right, let's go on to the uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, so we were awarded a, um, a DOE project a few years ago looking at uh, two issues, one code compliance and one energy performance of modular versus site-built multifamily commercial construction. So these are buildings that are typically four stories or greater above grade plane, uh, multifamily use. So that basically was defined as more on the permanent side of things, condominiums, 
uh, apartments, things of that nature, as opposed to hotels, dorms, uh, so forth. Um, the, the nexus, or really the idea behind this project was to see if the what we suspected was a higher level of quality control in modular resulted in a higher performing building. We came into the study and it's since pretty much been verified that the materials and equipment systems aren't much different between multifamily site build and multifamily modular. Where we suspect there could be some performance advantages is in the actual quality control of the modular process under a single point of control, under a climate controlled environment, as opposed to site built construction, which is not climate controlled and is usually uh, the products of two to three dozen trade partners and subcontractors. So again, we have a total of 20 buildings in the first part energy code compliance study where we've gone out and looked at 10 site built versus 10 modular to see if there is any differences in the code compliance and code performance of modular versus site build. We've also looked at 25 modular, uh, completed modular uh, multifamily projects with at least 24 months of post-occupancy energy use um, history in relation to about 120 um, site build projects of similar age, size, topology, so forth. The areas that we've been looking at for these buildings are in the metro areas of LA, San Francisco, Philadelphia, and Seattle, representing four distinct climate zones and covering about three major codes, Title 24 in California and ICC um, 2015, 2018, or variations thereof in the other regions. Next slide, please. So I think most of, of the audience is well aware of, of what modular is, what some of the advantages, disadvantages are, of course, with modular. Uh, the prefabrication process can begin in parallel with the site work and foundation. So these projects lend themselves really well to fast tracking uh, for schedule driven projects. Uh, we can significantly reduce uh, the construction schedules, get clients into their income producing buildings sooner, uh, reduce construction loan, interest carry, things of that nature, reduce weather delays associated with a climate controlled fabrication environment and improve product and safety again by having a single point of control as opposed to multiple trade partners or subcontractors. Uh, some of the trade-offs are added transportation cost particularly with 3D modular, the, the adages that oftentimes we're shipping air, uh, these boxes aren't terribly efficient to move, move long distances. Most uh, manufacturers have a, a radius of 500, usually no more than a thousand miles. And then the uh, transportation logistics starts to eat away at the benefits of modular. Uh, projects tend to be a little bit less adaptable I think most of these projects uh, from what we've, what we've seen is they're brought in during the design phase as opposed to being brought in at the onset of the design phase. So there's some inefficiency in having to design around an existing design, uh, lack of standardization in the industry. The, the common phrase I hear is that every project is a snowflake, every project is different. Uh, perception of inferior quality and this goes back to the to the idea that if something is prefabricated, it might not have the same uh, quality or aesthetics that a that a site built uh, project may have, particularly in the market rate sphere. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as been shown on some of the previous presentations, the offsite process is basically an assembly line process. Most of you are are doing this or have seen this. Uh, so starting with the, the uh, substructure, the, the four joist framing system, the systems build up from there uh, in an assembly line or workstation type environment. So the productivity is, is, is really profound because you have work crews that are very well trained in their specific task. And so these modules basically on rail systems will actually move through workstation to workstation from basic 
uh, framing components to the finished assembly. And these are usually somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80% complete before they are, are shipped out into the field. So again, this happens in parallel with the work that's being undertaken by the site general contractor, CM, for the site work and, and foundations. Now the site GC will typically come in at the end of the project when the modules are set and, and, and make all the MEP connections and finishes usually which take place in the hallways and common areas uh, and any other remaining uh, punch list type work before the building is uh, receives its certificate of occupancy. Next slide, please. Okay, so as far as the data that we're collecting and when we're collecting it, you can see kind of a laundry list of things there on the left-hand side, some of the major energy players associated with the envelope, HVAC system, lighting, uh, domestic hot water. These items were basically uh, provided to us. There's about 40 items that we look for when we go out and do plan reviews and factory and field inspections. And so these were basically provided to us by PNNL on their uh, lost savings methodology. Basically the, the energy uh, alternatives that are going to contribute most to energy performance of these buildings. And so there's a three part process in the field study. We do plan review of the CDs, also the, the com check or energy studies that go with those. Next step is a factory inspection. This is where we're looking mostly at envelope measures, things that are gonna be concealed later on in the project um, construction. And then the third part of it is once the modules have been set on site, we're going back in and looking at the near finished project just before occupancy where we're going to verify from the plans that um, the same equipment or comparable equipment has been set, lighting, fixtures, so forth and so on. Next slide, please. So at the end of the day, this gives us a bit of a snapshot of where we are. This project is still ongoing. But if you look at the, the number of, of projects uh, and, and how they compare in climate zone three and in climate zone four. So climate zone three, this would be our LA and San Francisco um, markets. Climate zone four, this would be our, our Seattle and Philadelphia. Uh, on average, these projects are in the 150,000 square foot range, um, six to seven stories in height. Uh, some of them are quite large. Some of them exceed more than a half million square feet. Some of them are small. So we've got a bit of a cross section within that of different types of, of multifamily commercial. Again, all of these are commercial coded um, projects um, that are inspected in the factory. Uh, under state jurisdiction, usually by a third party, because quite often these modules are fabricated out of the state. So approved third party inspectors in places like Idaho, uh, so forth, that inspect these units. And then once these units are approved, they can then be installed anywhere within that state jurisdiction without any additional uh, local jurisdiction or, or, or code requirements. And so looking at, at, at the modular versus the site built, uh, the numbers seem to favor, particularly in climate zone three, the um, energy performance, at least from a, a plan review and, and field inspection um, of these elements, uh, slightly better energy performance for the modular as opposed to the site built. Climate zone four, that's a little bit more balanced, more even. But at the end of the day, we've really not seen a huge difference between uh, the energy, the code compliance of the modular versus the site build. Next slide, please. Okay, again, the other part of the project is to take a look at, 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 at modular and site build from a post-occupancy standpoint and, and sequestering the energy uh, records, benchmarking data available on these buildings. Fortunately, every one of these jurisdictions now requires benchmarking of projects of a certain size and commercial designation. So we were fortunate enough to get the ENERGY STAR benchmarking data 
on a number of these buildings. We'll have 25 in total modular to compare versus somewhere north of 150 um, site-built buildings of similar size, age, topology, so forth and so on, in the same climate zones. Next slide, please. And so at the end of the day, the, the how this is shaking out so far with the 14 uh, projects that we've collected information on at this point, if you look down at the bottom in the shaded columns, the site uh, EUI, which is energy use intensity, usually in KBTU per square foot per year, okay? Uh, the modular is not too terribly uh, different than the site build. In fact, the site build is slightly better in terms of energy use intensity than the modular, but you have to dig into this a little bit further. Most of the modular are affordable, smaller units, as opposed to the site builds are more in the market uh, rate uh, spectrum. And so the modular units typically are smaller and the occupant density on these modular projects are higher. So when we account for that, and if you look at the things of that nature in terms of occupant density and other factors, actually the Energy Star scoring of the modular is quite a bit higher than the site built. Next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. So again, as, as I mentioned, the modular buildings typically have about a 50% greater uh, occupant density and almost nearly the same energy use intensity as their site built contemporaries. Next slide, please. Okay. On the home stretch here, it looks like something happened to our, our table there, but I'll try to walk you through that. Um, additionally, we did some lower door testing on modular versus site built. And if my memory serves, the, the average on the site built units that we tested, uh, the, the uh, air change rate was somewhere in the neighborhood of about three to four uh, room air changes, unit air changes per hour, compared to the average for the modular, which was a little bit higher at about six air changes per hour. But when you look into this a little bit further and look at air infiltration as a function of envelope area, uh, the numbers are almost identical. For both the site built and the modular under the same code, the air infiltration is somewhere around uh, 0.23, 0.24 uh, CFM per square foot of envelope area. So again, you can't just look at the air change rate because the modular units are typically smaller. They have higher surface area or envelope area relative to floor space. So when you normalize for that difference, then the air infiltration rate for the modular uh, comes out about equal to the site build. Now we have noticed for some of the modular projects, a bit of rework, you know, some relocation of condensate piping, things of that nature uh, in the field that may have contributed to a significantly higher uh, air infiltration rate around some of the HVAC cabinets and things of that nature. And a lot of the site built, we see a lot of mini split systems and some of the modular, we see a lot of through wall uh, PTAC, PTHP systems, which are inherently more um, leaky than the split systems that we see in the site build. Next slide, please. Okay, so really at the end of the day, as we suspected, since they're on, under similar or the same codes, there's really not a whole lot of difference in the materials and equipment. But what I think is, is clear uh, from our um, uh, field study so far is the level of quality control, particularly in the envelope. Next slide, please. And this will be our, our last slide. So if you look at the top row of pictures here, and you can pretty well go into any uh, modular manufacturing facility and see this. You see just a very, very high degree of envelope uh, quality control from the insulation coverage, um, the vapor barrier, the taping, flashing around uh, penetrations. It is just significantly higher and it's in a climate controlled environment. So we're not taping Tyvek when it's, you know, 10 degrees outside in, 
and or when it's raining. Okay, those of us that have spent our careers in site built construction, you can see some examples down on the bottom row of, of uh, photos. This this is not a surprise to you at all, where you have tears in the Tyvek and the air barrier uh, flashing that's that's peeling around penetrations. And why? Because you know the quality control aspect with having multiple contractors, trade partners doing this under austere weather conditions um, lends itself to um, a less efficient envelope. So that is pretty much all that I, I have. If we want to advance two slides, there's uh, some of my uh, contact information. If we want to go to the next one, last one, um, happy to answer any questions. Great. Well, thanks, Kevin. That was really interesting. Nice work. Um, and I'll invite Lucas and Ryan uh, to come come on the screen here. And so we do have a little bit of time for questions. So please enter uh, any burning questions in the question pane. Um, I see a couple in there right now. So we'll start with those. Um, so this is a question for Lucas. Um, what additional training slash upskilling would be needed to help the current construction workforce participate in uh, industrialized construction? And it's a two-part question. So that was the first. And then what strategies to manage displacement would you recommend? Yeah, so I think um, the answer to the first question is going to be related to the answer to the second question. So I think the answer to the first question has two parts. Um, you know, one is the incoming workforce and one is the existing workforce. And for the incoming workforce, uh, I mean, I think the reality is right now we have a substantial shortage of construction, um, you know, kind of a pipeline of construction labor and aging out of the existing workforce. So in my mind, there are a couple of priorities. Uh, one is is kind of starting pretty early uh, in, in kind of the, you know, school um, uh, uh, process, you know, going into at, at least going into high schools to try to convey the um, opportunities in construction, um, you know, for for good jobs, well-paying jobs, and also for evolution of jobs. And then emphasizing on that last point um, that construction jobs are increasingly, you know, technological jobs, and that they are not always about, you know, swinging a hammer in the rain. Uh, but they can, you know, they can be around, um, you know, kind of di digital tools. They can be in controlled factory environments uh, to the points Kevin was making. Um, and that means they may be more appealing to a broader set of potential workers. Uh, and they also may be accessible to people who were, uh, you know, for kind of f physical or, or social reasons, um, uh, you know, largely or completely excluded from the construction workforce, um, including you know folks like like who may who may have physical you know limitations. Um, uh, so you know the second the second question about displacement. Um, you know, to me the reality is that it's it's kind of yes and it's not doing industrialized construction so that we can you know do it all without having workers. It's doing industrialized construction because all of the work that needs to be done, both to fill the housing gap with efficient buildings and to do all the retrofit work that needs to be done, which is frankly a whole other construction industry that doesn't exist yet, is going to need to happen uh, both with at least the same number of workers and probably significantly more and with the benefit of industrialization and better productivity that comes from that. So in my mind, um, you know, the, the, the displacement, there are are enough you know jobs for um you know for ex the existing workforce and and for a lot more um and it's you know it's more of a question of for those folks in the existing workforce who aren't aging out um whether they want to stay more in on-site jobs there is still going to need be a lot of need for on-site work even if if there's more prefabrication uh, or whether they're interested in moving to um, to factory-based jobs uh, or you know other kind of industrialized jobs, um, and the answer to that is is complicated. It's going to have to happen at many different levels and across the country. Um, I can't say that I have the answer to it, but I can say that we're working on some uh, you know research and and kind of engagement with industry to understand at least to better understand 
what are the right questions to ask um, and you know what are some of the the potential problems that need to be addressed or challenges that need to be addressed more thought, more thoughtfully. Great, yeah, no, I think you, you definitely hit all hit all the right points there. Um, so this is a question um, that it might be uh, best suited for Kevin, but I think anybody can really answer this. Um, do you have any information about improvements in air quality with offsite construction, particularly in regards to reduced dust and other particulates? And I think Kevin, this maybe points to some of what you're finding in the field with regard to envelope uh, improvements and, and kind of focus on QA. Yeah, I think one of the major areas is in moisture control. You know, a site built project is exposed to moisture uh, intrusion until it's dried in. And even after it's dried in, there can be issues. Whereas uh, the offsite product that's uh, manufactured under roof in a climate controlled environment, um, it's much less subjected to to uh, moisture issues and mold and other types of asthma triggers than are um, a lot of the site built um, projects. So I'll, I'll let it go with that if any of the other speakers want to comment on that or I can elaborate if you'd like. Okay. Um, no, I think that's uh, that's good. So I, just for the sake of time, we'll try to get to a couple more questions here. Um, so this questions for Ryan. Um, so what is so kind of if I'm a state or jurisdiction, what is the number one thing, um, number one takeaway uh, that that I can do to help streamline building code implementation in offsite construction, or at least to help um, you know avoid some of the the challenges and um, you know misinformation or or uh, kind of lack of knowledge that's out there. Yeah, so I'll 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 cheat and give you maybe two. Um, okay, perfect. One is, one is I think you know certainly updating um, your codes you know to uh, more recent additions. So we've seen you know a lot of the sort of industrialized construction processes, like sh the use of shipping containers and those sorts of things, find their way into the newest codes. So I think that's you know certainly one piece of it. I think the second piece is you know looking to um, the practices that are contained, you know, within standards 1200 and 1205 uh, to really support efficient processes. So, um, you know, some states already have programs that that largely mirror the standards, um, but certainly uh, many have opportunities to um, you know, advance their programs through some of the criteria uh, that, that are within those standards. So I think looking to adopt those standards uh, would be a great way to do that as well. Great. Um, so I will kind of end things with one final question for all um, panelists here, and it's a kind of a, a fun forward looking one. Um, so looking in your crystal ball, where do you see the construction industry uh, in 10 years? So whoever wants to, to kick things off. Yeah, so I, I can certainly start. I mean, I'd, I'd love to see um, you know, sort of concepts of, uh, you know, zero energy buildings, resilient buildings in a box. So, you know, someone can sort of set performance requirements uh, and the offsite construction industry, uh, you know, can deliver those. Uh, and I think there's probably a few different things that, you know, lead up to that, um, including, you know, education uh, and training of code officials and the broader construction workforce. But um, I think that would be a, you know, great solution and you know, fill a lot of the needs uh, you know, that we have as a society. I'll give a slightly more general answer, not necessarily as linked to offsite construction, uh, but I think in my mind, if you know, if you want to see the future of construction, um, it's kind of like it's kind of like car regulations. You look at what California is doing, uh, and and you know, probably a lot a lot will follow. It's a little harder with construction than with cars, but uh, you know California is requiring um, on many buildings, you know, requiring solar. They're now in the process of banning the sale of most uh, gas appliances for buildings in the relatively near term. Uh, and you know, in my mind, where the California market goes, um, a, a lot of the a lot of the, the U.S. market is going to go, and it's just a numbers game. Um, I think, you know, again, coming back to sort of our central thesis for advanced building construction, uh, when you talk about the more stringent standards, not only for new buildings, 
uh, that you know still have to get built as as quickly as they were before, but also for existing buildings. And we see things like you know local law 97 in New York and other regulations, emergent regulations that apply to existing buildings uh, with increasing strictness. Um, in my mind, there is you know no way to meet that compliance uh, given the current you know construction trends and workforce without the kind of things that, that Ryan is talking about, um, both on the new construction side and on the retrofit side of these sort of, you know, packages in a box, uh, things where you're still going to use a lot of the same workforce for some of the kind of last mile deployment, uh, but they can get some of those pieces, you know, from their distributor or from the, you know, from the Home Depot uh, with some help from, you know, from the factory uh, to, to kind of get those installed um, and, you know, partnering with, with, uh, uh, teams that have the sophistication needed to deliver those those high performance solutions. Great, Kevin, you want to weigh in? Sure. I don't know if my opinion really makes a difference because 20 years ago I would have told you that we'd all be on BIM right now instead of you know having hard copy CDs, and that certainly hasn't happened either. But you know, I'll, I'll say one thing with regard to the offsite. I think we're on a good trajectory, but I think at some point you know, at the end of the day right now, we're essentially doing the same things in site-built buildings off-site. And so I think that the future of that has got to be a little bit more um, innovation into new methods and new materials um, that make these buildings higher performance, uh, more efficient, more market penetrating, because, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, we're still stuck on this 5% market penetration. Uh, and it's not all technology. There's got to be some differences in our mentality, how we deliver projects and having, you know, instead of selling the modular builders a super sub halfway through design, uh, the modular process has to be integrated at the front end of design. It's got to be more um, integrated into um of the design process so there's my 30 seconds great well appreciate uh everybody's time thanks for sticking with us i know we went a little bit long but thanks kevin ryan and lucas for uh presenting and providing such uh great information thanks everybody and um we we'll look forward to talking with you all again thanks thanks, thanks. thanks all all right thanks